Let us pray and we'll get right into the word. Father, we thank you so much that you would give us your heavenly food, Lord God, to sustain us. Lord, I pray that the word of God will come forth with clarity and power, Lord, above my preparation, Lord God. I pray that hearts that are seated here, Lord God, will be ready to have the word, the seed of the word planted in their hearts. May it bring forth fruit, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, today we are going on a road trip with the refugees from Egypt. We are leaving the wilderness of Sinai, the desert, and we are going to the wilderness of Paran. The people tell me that God directs them with a cloud by day and with a pillar of fire by night, like a heavenly GPS, and that a leader named Moses leads the people along with his spokesman and brother Aaron. They told me of bondage in Egypt and harsh labor and taskmasters that God brought them out from with these ten plagues that ravaged Egypt to the point where they let them go. They told me of a Red Sea crossing that was miraculous. And then they told me that this God that delivered them gave them ten commandments on top of Mount Sinai and a multitude of other laws pertaining to their diet, to their worship, to their home life, to even their intimacy. Then they told me that they were hungry and thirsty and that God gave them a heavenly meal plan to sustain them throughout the journey to the land that's going to be flowing with milk and honey. It would be manna. But to feed over 600,000 people, not including the priests, children, and women, you're going to need a lot of bread. (sighs) But God would supply. So before we reach our next rest stop in the wilderness of Paran, it'll take about three days, but only if we don't make a stop. However, as we study the word, we'll realize they do make a stop. And it's at a graveyard. Title of today's message is Graves of Craving. Graves of Craving. We're going to be in Numbers chapter 11. Numbers 11 for those of you turning pages or using your devices. Let's go through verses 1 through 3. Now when the people complained, it displeased the Lord, for the Lord heard it and his anger was aroused. So the fire of the Lord burned among them and consumed some in the outskirts of the camp. Then the people cried to Moses, and when Moses prayed to the Lord, the fire was quenched. So he called the name of the place Tabera, which literally meant burning because the fire of the Lord had burned among them. We start out on this road trip. We're going to a rest stop. God has given us food. He's given us laws. He's provided his heavenly GPS. And what's the first thing that the people do? Complain. Isn't that what happens to us when we get ready for a road trip? We pack up everything. The kids' diaper bags and toys. We make sure we've got everything. Moms, you've done a great job. But one thing you can never anticipate are the complaints that are going to come to you. You can pack everything. And you think the complaints are only going to come from the kids. And they come from the adults, too. It's almost like it's human to complain, to find fault with, to not have enough, to not be satisfied. And we find that here as well. But why did God respond with fire? Why did God burn these people for complaining? We get to our first point here, which is prayerfully consider the content of your complaints. Why is complaining so dangerous? It's dangerous because it speaks to God's providing for you. When you complain, prayerfully consider. You see, that fire was burning amongst the people, and it burned those that were on the outskirts of the camp, and it didn't stop until what? Moses prayed. If you have a complaint or a concern, I urge you, please bring it in prayer before the Lord. Don't lob complaints from the outskirts of camp, thinking that God, number one, won't hear or care, because when we complain, We're basically saying, God, you're not good enough. You didn't prepare well enough for me. You didn't give me what I needed, and so I'm upset. So prayerfully consider the content. What are you complaining about today? You walked in here, but maybe you're frustrated. Maybe you have a complaint against the Lord. Is it legitimate? Has God already provided for you in that area? Please don't allow your burning complaints to steal the contentment that you had, the gratitude that you should have, and the joy that is your strength. Continue to pray like Moses did, and that burning complaint might get squashed in the presence of prayer. Let's go to verses 4 through 6. Now the multitude who were among them yielded to intense craving. So the children of Israel also wept again and said, Who will give us meat to eat? We remember the fish which we ate freely in Egypt, the cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, and the garlic. All organic, I'm, I'm sure. No GMOs. But now our whole being is dried up. There is nothing at all except this manna. Now, the mixed multitude pertains to the fact that on this road trip, there weren't just Hebrews here. There were 
Egyptian insurrectionists, anyone who was anti-government, along with a whole bunch of people who were like, I see these plagues of gnats and flies. I see water turning to blood. I'm out of here. So don't assume that because you're sitting here that you're part of the people of God. Being here just means that you are smart enough to not want to go to hell. It doesn't mean that you have a heart for the Lord. And we can't assume that because our children come or because our neighbors go to a church that they're saved. Sometimes we can be in a place but not really be in the place. And so they began to crave these, this mixed multitude. A lot of these people, again, weren't the people of God, but their yielding to intense craving had an effect on the actual children of God, the people who were Israelites. So much so that they began to crave the Egyptian delicacies. But what did they forget? In Exodus 3, verse 7, it says, And the Lord said, I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt, and I've heard their cry because of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. So while they're remembering leeks and onions and fish and you name it, they're forgetting, wait a minute, we were oppressed. We were whipped. We were told by our taskmasters to make bricks, and sometimes we had to go and get our own hay to do it. It was back-breaking labor, and we cried out to God, and God heard us. Oh, but we, we're not remembering that now. I want leeks. I want onions. I want the delicacies. Which brings us to point two. Be aware of the company you keep because cravings are contagious. If you are around people that constantly are looking at every curvaceous thing that passes by, you will do the same. It's just a matter of time. If you're around people who want to get a good education, this is why you always want your kids, you want to know what who their friends are because you know they have an influence. And it's the same thing here. When we hang around people who are finding their contentment in God, great. But when, you find, when you're hanging out with those and having intimate fellowship, I'm not talking coworkers. I'm talking you're hanging out. You're, you're doing life with people who have this constant desire for other things and not godly things. It will have an effect on you. Ladies, are you reading romance novels and going to every romantic comedy that's out there in the theaters? And then you're wondering, why do I want a man so bad? Well, because you're watching stuff that's creating that urge and feeding that desire. You were content, but now that you've seen this movie, what about me, Lord? <laughs> Guys, do you find that you're not as attracted to your wife as you used to be? Maybe it's because you've been shopping with your eyes all the time. You can't really appreciate what God has put on your plate when you're looking at everybody else's food. And it is easier to be content with the things that God has given you when you hang out with people who are content with the things that God has given them. Remember, their outcry for food had already been met back in Exodus 16. God had already given them the meal plan. So it wasn't like they were hungry. But their memory of the Egyptian delights was more vivid to them than what God was dropping from heaven every morning. It's like a kid opening the fridge, and maybe your kids do this, fully stocked. Everything's in the, in the fridge. And you yell with tears coming down their face, there's nothing to eat. I just went to the store. There's bread. There's cheese. There's cold cuts. Make a sandwich. No, I want those special toaster strudel. I want something else. Sometimes we're just big kids, really. What we're basically saying to God is you're not good enough. Thanks for what you gave me, but it's not that great. It's not enough for me. It doesn't entertain me. And so we have a lack of gratitude and thanksgiving, which brings us to our third point. Sinful cravings will devour your prayer life, your joy, and your gratitude. If you're finding it hard to be thankful, chances are it's because you're craving things of this world, things of the flesh. Verses 7 through 9. Now the manna was like coriander seed, and its color like the color of bdellium. The people went about and gathered it, or ground it on millstones, or beat it in the mortar, cooked it in pans, made cakes of it, and the taste was like the taste of pastry prepared with oil. And when the dew fell on the camp in the night, the manna fell on it. And so their cravings stemmed from a disdain for the manna. The food that God was hand-delivering to them every morning. Psalm 78, verses 23 through 25 reads, Yet he commanded the clouds above and opened the doors of heaven, had rained down manna on them to eat, and given them of the bread of heaven. Men ate angels' food. He sent them food to the full. Angelic food wasn't enough for them. I'm talking, this is the best food you could get. I mean, today we're all the rage about getting non-GMO, no preservatives, because we want the best for our babies. And God was giving them angels' food, food from heaven with no, no bad side effects. Didn't make you gassy or bloated. You're not allergic to it. You don't need an EpiPen by your side. It was the best food you could get, and still it wasn't enough. It was too monotonous, Lord. 
We've made it into cakes. Look, we've done manna cake, manna pie, manna biscuits. We're done. We've done all that we can with the manna, and I'm done with the manna. They were bored. Do you remember how you teach your kids, and maybe you learn the Lord's Prayer, and it says, give us this day our daily bread? It pertains to this. The fact that God would use food to test their desire for him. This is all a test. Because God was filling them. It wasn't that they were hungry. It's that they desired the things of this world. They desired the things of the flesh. Even while walking amongst the camp of God. Jesus said in John 6, 48, I am the bread of life. Now, manna wasn't flashy. It wasn't mouth-watering. It isn't something you'd want to look at on the Food Network, probably. But it was sustaining. It was satisfying. Now, see, Satan, what he does is he peddles candy to you. It's in a nice flashy wrapper, and he says, pop this in your mouth. It's sweet. It comes in a variety of flavors and colors. You put it in your mouth, and you think, this is really good. It's much better than that boring manna, but it's a candy-coated razor blade. It's only a matter of time before you get to that blade. It cuts. And when it cuts, you wonder, God, what happened? Why me? But it's because you chose the sweetness over the sustaining power of God's word or the fellowship of God's people. Somehow you traded in the supernatural manna for the things of this world. That candy that Satan peddles to you only creates holes in your life that you consistently try to fill, never being able to fill it for very long, but moving on to the next newest flavor, the next newest craze. Hankering for the forbidden. Are you hankering for a forbidden or forgotten fruit? Maybe it's been a long time and Satan's been like, you know, you haven't done that in a while. Don't you want to go back and see how it feels like? You haven't talked to him in a while. Why don't you text that old boyfriend or that friend you found on Facebook? Guys, that girl that's trying to holler at you, you married. Stay away. Far, far away. Singles, are you satisfied with your singleness or constantly looking, is this the one, is that the one, is this the one, is that the one? You will never find rest doing that. Do you have a spouse, but you're not even content with that? You're looking to upgrade. <laughs> what about with your present lifestyle, your salary, or with the very word of God? Have you grown tired? Are you, are, did you outgrow this all of a sudden? I think not. It is much easier and healthier for you to get full off bread than full off candy. Which brings us to point four. Sinful cravings keep you looking everywhere except up. It'll have you looking back in your past. It'll have you looking to the future of whatever it is that you're dreaming of. But it'll never have you look up to God for that which you're desiring. Verse 10. Then Moses heard the people weeping throughout their families. Everyone at the door of his tent and the anger of the Lord was greatly aroused. Moses also was displeased. Here you see loud, boisterous weeping. It was similar to the weeping God heard when he came and sent Moses to free them. So what is that saying? These people were crying as if God was lashing their backs again. They were crying as if they were going to die if they didn't have what they craved back in Egypt. And they were making God out to be a taskmaster, not a good father. You know, kids tell on their parents all the time. Kids will testify to the kind of parent you are. And right here, this is a snapshot of them trying to prove that God wasn't as good as he said he was. Because if he was, he'd give us what we want. He was giving them heavenly room service every morning, heavenly GPS by the cloud, warmth at night. It still wasn't enough. We're going to move down, uh, skipping where Moses basically asked the Lord for help. These people are driving me nuts. They're craving food. God says, I'm going to give you, get 70 elders. I'm going to anoint them with the same anointing that's on you to help you so that you can lead more effectively without that burden all on your shoulders. We take it back to verse 18 where we pick it up. And God gives him a word to tell the people. Then you shall say to the people, consecrate yourselves for tomorrow and you shall eat meat for you have wept in the hearing of the Lord saying, who will give us meat to eat? For it was well with us in Egypt. For it was well with us in Egypt. That's a lot of revisionist history going on here. Don't you remember? Maybe the wounds of Egypt healed, making you think that it wasn't so bad. And with the passage of time, we can fool ourselves into thinking, oh, my sin, I wasn't that bad of a sinner. I mean, I sinned, but it wasn't that bad. Oh, how the passage of time will make us forget God and remember our sin in a positive light. They already have lost the battle of the mind, just like in the garden. In Genesis 3, verses 1 through 6, Adam and Eve had everything. It was utopia. And what does Satan do? He slithers in and suggests, subtle, subtly suggests 
that God may be not all he said he was. Maybe he didn't really mean you can't eat all of it. And maybe the reason he doesn't want to eat is because he really doesn't want you to be like him, like he said he does. Uh, don't you want to know what good and evil is like and be on his level? All it took was some subtle suggestions. And they looked at everything that God gave them and threw it away for a bite. Which brings us to point five. Sinful cravings must be crushed while they are thoughts because you will be powerless when they propose action. The Bible says to cast down every imagination and every thought that exalts itself against the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Now, it says in the rest of verse 18 that, Therefore the Lord will give you meat and you shall eat. And this is where the kids in your house probably are like, Yay, we cried, we whined, we, we embarrassed them in the store, and we're getting what we want. They think they've won, and God's going to teach them a lesson about what they were asking for. Verse 19, You shall eat meat not one day, nor two days, nor five days, nor ten days, nor twenty days, but for a whole month, until it comes out of your nostrils and becomes loathsome to you. Oh, I'm going to give you some meat. Oh, you want that toy? No problem. I got that for you. When was the last time you overindulged and felt good about your overindulging? When was the last time you left the buffet after your four plates and said, yep, that was good. I feel good about myself. I can't breathe, nor can I button this, but I, whew, I'm sweating. Yep, can't even drink water right now. It's just a lot of sloshing right now. This is, I don't look godly at all right now. I hope nobody sees me. You know, you had that whole day planned. You were going to get some stuff done, but you decide to watch Netflix and binge a show that you think might be good. Eight, nine hours later, you didn't accomplish anything. Someone goes, how was that show? It was okay. Nine hours and okay. Or maybe you love shopping. I love technology. I love to get gadgets if I only had the money. But maybe you shop, you buy that thing, and you think it's going to revolutionize your whole life. That's what infomercials are about. They sell you that it's going to change your life. You buy it, and it just runs up your electric bill, breaks, and now i got to find space on my countertop for it. Point six, our desires will determine what we despise. They desired Egypt and the delicacies of Egypt, but therefore they had to despise God in the process because what was keeping them from Egypt? God was. So because of what they craved, they had to despise all holy things, all righteous things, and therefore they had to despise God. And anything that gets in the way of what you're craving today, you're going to despise it. If you crave holy things, you will despise unholy things. But if you crave the sweet pleasures of sin, you will hate anything and everything that has to do with God and walking a holy and righteous life. Because you have despised the Lord who is among you and have wept before him, saying, Why did we ever come out of Egypt? Why did we ever come out of Egypt? They, it's like sin took a part of their brain. But you know it has a way of doing the same thing to us, doesn't it? Warps our thinking. Never, ever forget why you turned away from sin, why you turned away from the world. Never forget it. Because in those times of difficulty, because they were in the wilderness, which is the desert, not wilderness trees, but desert. When you're out there and you're holding on to God, sometimes it can be dark. Sometimes it can be not as fruitful as you'd like it to be. And it's in those moments Satan will ask you, why did you ever even become a Christian? You're not having much fun now. You're not able to do, you're not even staying up late. You're going to sleep early. You read in this ancient book. Why would you do all these things? It's in those times of lack or seemingly not, no fun that Satan will come. And you better have something more than Jesus wept. You better have something more than I like how I feel when I'm in church. Because what happens when the feelings go? There you go. Verse 21 and 22, Moses tries to, in his mind, figure out how God's going to feed these people for a month. Like every good leader, you try to figure it out yourself, even though you tell people, I have great faith in God. And so he tries to figure it out. And in verse 23, he says, and the Lord said to Moses, has the Lord's arm been shortened? Now you shall see whether what I say will happen to you or not. Isaiah 55 verse 9 reads, for as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. I struggle with this, but I have to remember this scripture because I'm not on God's level, and I don't understand all of his plans. He's given me what I need to know, but it's on a need-to-know basis. And sometimes the reason why God hasn't revealed it to you is because he wants to surprise you with something blessed from heaven. Sometimes it's because he wants to teach you a lesson or blow your mind with how good he is. But if you have an incessant need to know everything, you're going to have a hard time on this journey called life. 
Let's go down to verses 31 and 32. Now a wind came, went out from the Lord, and it brought quail from the sea and left them fluttering near the camp, about a day's journey on one side, a day's journey on the other, all around the camp at about two cubits. So they were fluttering about three feet off the ground, easy to obtain and knock them out of the air above the surface of the ground. And the people stayed up all that day, all that night, and all the next day gathering this quail. He who gathered least gathered ten homers, and they spread them out for themselves all around the camp. Now contrast this gathering process with the, oh, we got to pick up manna every morning. Oh, what a drag. Now they're in a frenzy. God causes this quail, these quail to fly at a good three feet above the ground, and they're just knocking them out there, and they're just gathering them up. And how long did it take them to gather up? It took more than a full day and a half for them to get all of the quail together. I don't hear them weeping. I don't hear them crying. I don't hear them complaining. And you know what else I don't hear? I don't hear them writing a song or composing a melody in thanks to God for granting us this quail smorgasbord. No, you don't hear any of those things. They're just frantically saying, ooh, let me look up some Pinterest recipes on how to prepare quail 20 different ways. Yes, quail burgers, quail quesadillas. <laughs> but contrast this with what God was giving them. God, while they slept, would give them food. They didn't have to sow, but they reaped. They didn't have to plant, but they harvested. It wasn't backbreaking labor. It was just wake up, pick it up, and I'm going to give you enough for you and your family every single day consistently. The quality is awesome, and you can count on me to provide it for you every day, but that wasn't enough. Give us the quail instead. Give us the quail. What are you willing to sacrifice? Are you willing to sacrifice sleep like these people did? Because they stayed up all night and the next day picking it up. Are you willing to sacrifice sleep? Are you willing to sacrifice time with the Lord for that which you crave more? Point seven is our sinful cravings have no limits or boundaries. Because what's going to happen is as you follow this craving to craving to craving, you end up doing things that you never thought you were going to do. And like me, maybe you get to a point where you're like, that's the lowest, most low-down, dirty thing I could ever do or conceive in my mind. And you know what happens later? You end up surprising yourself with how low you really can go doing something else. Psalm 78, 29 through 31 but so they ate and were filled, for he gave them their own desire. They were not deprived of their craving, but while their food was still in their mouths, the wrath of God came against them and slew the stoutest of them and struck down the choice men of Israel. When it says the stoutest, it meant the fattest, the ones that had already been filled. They were already used to being filled, and they had gluttonous, overindulgent desires. It slew them, and it slew the choice, or young men. And maybe you're not a young person, but maybe you're young in the faith. Maybe you haven't been following the Lord for a while. I encourage you, I beg you, to learn this lesson of overindulgence and craving the things of this world. Because in verse 34 it says, So he called the name of that place Kibroth Hata'ava, which is the graves of craving. Notice that he struck them with what? A plague. When was the last time they saw plagues come and hit a land or hit a people? It was back in Egypt. Notice how their sinful cravings brought back the same judgment that was on Egypt, plagues. And it destroyed them. It destroyed them. Lisa Turkus writes in her book, Made to Crave, Food can fill our stomachs, but never our souls. Possessions can fill our houses, but never our hearts. Sex can fill our nights, but never our hunger for love. Children can fill our days, but never our identities. Jesus wants us to know only he can fill us and truly satisfy us. We must scrutinize our desires at the thought level. Consider what the fruit of that desire will be. And God forbid you die on the way to that desire. What will they say about you? Deuteronomy 8 verse 3 says, So he humbled you, allowed you to hunger, and fed you with manna which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know that man shall not live by bread alone, but lives by every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord. And Jesus, when he was tempted on the brink of full-blown starvation, and death was probably imminent, Satan came at him, but he defeated him by quoting this verse, remembering that God sustains me. I don't need bread. I need his word every day. Our cravings and our passions define us. Jesus had intense cravings as well, but his meat was to do the will of the Father and to complete the work that he was set out to do. Is that your desire today? I pray that that will be your desire, that as you raise your children up, you will tell them your greatest desire on the face of the earth needs to be to do what God has called you to do and to complete the work. Because what God did opened a door for us. 
and finishing his work so that we can have freedom from our personal Egypt, our personal bondage to sin. And did Jesus' craving for us that we would be in fellowship with him, where did that take him? It took him to the grave too. But he didn't stay in the grave, did he? He rose. He rose from the grave. Jesus was willing to go to the grave for what he craved. Are you? Are you willing to go to death for what you crave? Your cravings will take you there. Whether they're holy cravings or unholy cravings, they will all take us to the grave. But only one rose from the grave. Do you want to live with holy cravings that you don't have to be ashamed of? Are you tired of being beaten down by pornography? Are you tired of serving the bottle, serving the pills? Aren't you tired of being tossed to and fro and then coming in here and feeling that conviction? There's a way to get that conviction off of you, and that is to come before the Lord. And instead of satisfying yourself in the things of this world, say, where's that manna? The manna is right here. Every morning, I pick it up. God, I know it's not flashy. I know it's not a New York Times bestseller right now. I know nobody really wants to talk about this or mention it, but I want to hear from it. I want to receive the word of God. I want to give it to my kids. I want to do what it says because I want to reap those benefits. And if I go to the grave reading this, what will they say? He was a man who loved this word. It was a mom that prayed and loved that word. Grandma was always reading that Bible. Our cravings will define us. And you know, the camp moved on after that. They left those bodies behind. And all you had were graves of people who, who craved the sins of this world, the things of this world, and a bunch of dead quail bones and feathers. May that not be said of us. May that not be said of us. Let us pray. Father, we thank you that you give us pure food. Lord God, you give us that which is from on high. Lord, there are no side effects there are no ill effects to consuming your word, Lord God. I pray that you will give your people a hunger and a thirst for righteousness, for you said that they will be filled. God, I pray for those that are empty, that are lacking, Lord God. I pray that they will not look at their lack as purely financial or emotional, but it's spiritual first. And so, Lord, I pray that you will satisfy them with your fresh manna, with your presence. And for those that are trapped in Egypt, Lord God, before the judgment comes and the plagues come and visit them, God, may they cry out to you, and follow the God of the Bible. Follow the one that is leading us to a land flowing with milk and honey, that abundant life that he has for us. I pray all these things in Jesus' name.